pastor. So this is vitally, vitally important. Take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 130. I want to pick up on the message I preached last week about sin. You recall I quoted or, or gave you three, a trilogy of texts last week, Romans 3, 23, for all sin comes short of the glory of God. And then uh, we talked about that, that all have sinned, the wages of sin is death, and then every knee is going to bow. That's a simple, simple syllabus of the message from last Sunday. And then we talked about sin in the message. We talked that, that sin has become an unimportant subject to the world today. It seems like we have just tried to, in any way we can, do away with the subject of sin. And I reminded you last week that we have modernized it, we have glamorized it, we have rationalized it, and we have civilized it. And through all of that, we finally discovered, even though we've tried to explain it away, even though we've tried to do away with sin, we discovered that you cannot do away with it. We discovered that the only thing you can do is bring it under the blood of Jesus Christ and let him do away with it. We, we have to bring it to the Lord and, and come under the blood of Christ for the cleansing and forgiveness that he offers sin. He's the only one that can forgive it. Amen? And so we just we need to understand that. I, I, I was thinking... Uh, Ray, I, I love to go back to the old hymns because they teach us so much of our, our theology. In 1876, I went back and looked. Robert Lowry wrote the great old hymn, Nothing But the Blood. Y'all know that hymn, don't you? Nothing But the Blood. Well, you, you know the words, but let me just give them to you real quickly again. It says, what can wash away my sin? Say it. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my pardon, this I see. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my, uh -oh, for, and make me whole again is the blood of Jesus. For, oh, um, I lost my place. Now, nothing can for sin atone. I told you I can't sing. For, now, now can for sin atone. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Naught of good that I have done. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And then it says, Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Say it. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Our sin has to come under the blood in order for us to be forgiven and pardoned for our sins. Our text today teaches us much about sin. Look at it with me, if you will, in Psalm 130. It says, Out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord. This is David talking. Lord, hear my voice. Let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? But there is forgiveness with thee, that thou mayest be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul doth wait. And in his word do I hope. My soul waiteth for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. I say more than they that watch for the morning. Let Israel hope in the Lord. Now listen, for, listen to this. For with the Lord there is mercy and with him is plenteous redemption. Isn't that a good word? Plenteous redemption. And he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Listen to me this morning. The blood of Jesus is the only thing that can wash away your sin. So let's talk this morning about this sin that, that the King David was talking about here. Number one, we have to recognize our sin. In other words, we, we have to recognize it for what it is. It is what it is. That's a term everybody's using today. It is what it is. The psalmist uses the word iniquities here in verse 3. Look at it. He says, If thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? The Bible tells us, actually, there are three words that it uses for sin. One is transgress, one is the word sin, and the other is iniquity. I want to talk about those very quickly this morning. The word transgress means to do that which is forbidden. It, it means to describe an act of deliberate rebellion. 
It means you choose or disobey a command. You park where there's a no parking sign. You go where it says no trespassing. We easily take that, that attitude with, with how we trust God's law. We believe they apply to everybody else, but the truth is they apply to us all. So we transgress the iniquity or the plan of God. Secondly, we have the word sin. It means to fail. It means to fail at what we're required to do. It literally means to miss the mark. It's like the archer who pulls the arrow back and lets it go, but he misses the target. We, we not only do that which is forbidden, transgress, we fail to measure up to that which is required of us. And so we sin against God. God. And then the third word for sin in the Bible is iniquity. It's the strongest of all the words used in the Old Testament to talk about the subject of sin. And it literally means to pervert that which is good or to twist the truth. It, it represents the corruption of the heart. In our innermost being, we are corrupt by nature. We all have sinned and come against God. In our thoughts, in our desires, we're evil. And therefore, we need forgiveness not only from what we've done, but also from who we are. You see, we will never, never, never successfully deal with sin until we own it. You know, I, I heard preachers all my life say, you, you can't get somebody saved until you get them lost. Amen? You can't get somebody saved until you get them lost. Somebody... When I got saved, I had to first recognize I was a sinner. Amen? If you're here today or listening online, you're saved. You got saved because you had to realize you were a sinner. I'm going to say more about that in a minute. It is a, it is a sickness of the soul. Iniquity is. It's a corruption of the heart. Joseph Parker said sin is a raised hand. It's a clenched fist. It's a blow in the face of God. It's rebellion against God. It's, 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 it's putting God and what God stands for down. And folks, i got to tell you, every day today when I watch the news, I see people in America just putting their fist in the face of God, mocking Him and saying that it really don't count. They can't understand what sin is because they don't admit that they're sinners. Sin is a, it's a serious, deep-seated affliction within all of us. It's an alienation of us from God, and it brings us under His divine judgment. It's a lamb. It's not a lamb. It's a lion, a roaring lion. It's more deadly than any poison. It will destroy you forever. You need to be very careful with sin in your life. Not only must we recognize sin... But secondly, we got to personalize sin. This is what I was alluding to a while ago. You see, it's one thing to see sin in somebody else. And we're very proficient at that in today's society. But it's something else to see it within ourselves. Look, look at what the psalmist says here in verse 3 again. He says, if the Lord should his mark iniquity, who could stand? The implication here is no one. None of us could stand in our sin. We're all guilty sinners. We're all guilty of our sin. There, there can be no realistic dealing with sin until we recognize what it is and personalize it in our hearts and in our lives. Another old hymn was written by Isaac Watts in 1707. It's amazing how these have lived through centuries of time. In that great old hymn he penned at the cross, the original version first said, Alas, and did our Savior bleed, and did my sov uh, sov sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? A few years ago, we changed that term worm to the present form, for sinners such as I. And now in today's church, many people are singing it, for a person such as I. So in 280 years, we have gone from being worms to sinners, now to a person. If we keep watering down sin, sooner or later we're going to realize that there was no purpose to Jesus dying on the cross. I think of King David here, who was guilty of both adultery and murder. 
his sin haunted him day and night until he was confronted by the prophet. And in that confrontation, he humbly accepted the accusation and repented, saying, I have sinned against the Lord. Only then, only then did he find the forgiveness he was looking for. That's what happened to you when you got saved. You recognized, I'm a sinner. There's no hope for me outside of Jesus Christ. And you came under His blood and His forgiveness. And you are gloriously, wonderfully, forever saved. That's a good word for us today. To celebrate the fact that we were saved by Christ and by Him alone. There is no other way to be forgiven of your sin. To deal effectively with one's sin, we must come face to face with our own guilt and our own wrong dealing. Last week, we talked about Romans 3.23, for all sin comes short of the glory of God. Romans 3.22 says, for there is no difference. We're all bad. We're all guilty. We, we often categorize ourselves rich man, poor man, conservative, liberal, Protestant, Catholic, Baptist, Methodist, good, evil. It goes on and on and on. But think about, if you will, that parable of the publican and the Pharisee. On one hand stands the Pharisee. He's a self-satisfied man. He's quick to condemn his neighbors and slow to acknowledge fault within himself. You remember what it said. On the other hand stands this truly penitent little man who's so ashamed of his sin that he can't even lift up his face. He's weeping and crying for the mercy of God. He, he doesn't have time to magnify wrongdoing of himself and of others. He's crying out to God. One is a self-centered, self-righteous Pharisee who could not even lift up his face and pray, God be merciful to me a sinner, but rather he accused everybody else and flaunted himself before God. Lord, I thank thee that I, I'm not as these others who are extortioners and unjust and adulterers. And he went home dignified. But I want to tell you, that little publican who was so ashamed of his sin that he couldn't even pray right. He just, God, I'd be merciful to me. And he was penitent and repentant. I want to tell you, he went home justified. He got it right. He got it right. It's always the holiest of men who are more penitent. Samuel Rutherford said these words, when I look at my sinfulness, sinfulness, my salvation is to me my Savior's greatest miracle. Boy, I'm thankful I'm saved today, aren't you? I'm thankful that God loved me enough that he gave Jesus so Jesus could die on the cross and that precious shed blood that we celebrated in the Lord's Supper as we remembered him and what he did on the cross for us just a, a couple of weeks ago. It, it reminds us of the price that was paid, but that price is that it's sufficient to wash away all our sins. There cannot be any forgiveness until we come face to face with our own sin, our personal sin. Until we accept our gift, we can blame no one else for our sins but ourselves. And so we stand condemned until we deal with them and come under the blood. The psalmist teaches that we must recognize our sin, secondly, personalize our sin, and then thirdly, we need to vocalize our sin. Notice what the Bible says here in verse 1 again, Psalm 130, verse 1. Out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord. I have cried unto thee. Notice where he was when he began to pray. The Bible says he was in the depths. Man, we know about depths in this day and age, don't we? There's all kinds of depths. There's depths of despair. There's depths of poverty. There's depths of stress. There's depths of sorrow. We're, we're dealing with depths of mental illness and mental darkness and emotion today. We're dealing with the darkness of sin, the, the middle depths of sin. That's where the psalmist was. His own sin had brought him down to that point, to the depths of life. I, I've been there, haven't you? We've all been there in time. But there's a good word for us today. Our Lord is perfectly capable of getting down in the depths with us. I'm thankful for that. In Genoa, Italy, after World War II, they commissioned the, the building or the sculpture of an eight-ton statue of Jesus Christ. 
And unlike most cities that do that and place that great sculpture up on a high hill where everybody could look at it, there, there, was, a, there was a bay there. There, there was a, a, a place there where a tremendous war, battle went on during World War II. Many ships went down. Many men died and are lying at the bottom of that bay out there. And this city had this eight-ton Christ commissioned and built or carved, and they took it out and they lowered it down to those depths to honor all those heroic lives that lay at the bottom of the sea where they had all perished. And they call that statue the Christ of the Deep. I want you to know today that Jesus is the Christ of the deep in our lives. No matter how far down you get, he's able to meet you there. I was counseling with a lady one day, and she said, Preacher, I, I, I'm so discouraged. And I said, well, why? And she said, well, I just can't pray anymore. And I said, what do you mean you can't pray anymore? She said, well, it's like, like my prayers don't get above the rooftop. And I said, well, ma'am, don't you believe that God's perfectly able to get below the roof? Amen. He, he's, the, he's the Christ of the deep. And I want you to know that not only will he meet you there, he'll lead you out of the depths. He'll lift you up and bring you out. Verse 8 says, look at it, verse 8. He will redeem us. He will redeem us from all. Our sins, our iniquities. Not, all, not only ours, not some, not one, but all of our sins. When we recognize our sin, and we personalize our sin, and we vocalize our sin, we can then take to the Savior all of that and ask for forgiveness and be cleansed. So let me close today by asking you a question that's written in another hymn we sing. Let me just ask you what it says. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in the blood this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed? In the blood of the Lamb. His bowed and eyes closed. I want to ask you this morning, friend. Do you know that you're saved? And if you don't know this morning, then I want to tell you the only way you can be saved is to come to Jesus. He's the only answer. The blood of Christ is the only way to be forgiven and washed clean from your sin. You say, well, Brother Sid, how do I do that? Well, you do this. You pray this prayer. Right where you are, pray this prayer. Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. And Jesus, I ask you this morning, Lord, hear my heart. I know I'm a sinner. And I've heard this message, and I hear that Jesus is the only answer. And the blood can wash my sins white as snow. So, Jesus, I want to tell you this morning, I'm sorry for my sins. I repent of them. And I ask you, Lord Jesus, to come in my heart and save my soul. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. And Jesus, I want to give you my life from this day forward. Amen. Have you just prayed that prayer, whether you're in this house or at your house? You just got saved. There's not a greater decision you'll ever make than that decision. Brother Jerry's going to come stand down here for us. I'm going to ask you, God touched your heart in this building this morning to come and just say to him, I prayed that prayer. Maybe you need to come to the altar, whatever you need to do. We just want to give you a chance to work with God this morning in your life and let him change you if you need to. If you're online, you prayed that prayer and asked Jesus in your heart. In the morning, why don't you call the church office and say, I got saved yesterday. Give them your name because we want to pray for you and we want to celebrate the fact that you got saved today. So we'll stand. We'll have just a moment of music. Ray's going to lead us. If God's touched your heart, we want to ask you to come this morning as we sing. Come on, right now.
great sermon. I, I hope you got out of that what I got out of it. Um, I need a motion that we enter into church conference. Second? Second. All in favor, say amen. amen. All right, we're here today to do a little bit of business, and there's a little bit more than what I had anticipated. Um, Sue uh, called me the other day and said that she'd had some letters that had come before her that we have not acted on. And so, Sue, if you would, go ahead and read the names. Well, I sort of took it on myself to go ahead and grant those letters, and that is what I want you to give me permission to do. As the uh, church letters come in, as the request come in, comes in, I usually do this at a monthly business meeting which we have not had since March. <laughs> and, uh, but we have had some and I waited for a long time and I thought, don't need to do that. So I move that you grant me permission to uh, grant letters as requested. Okay, y'all understand what she's asking for. She's making a motion that the people who want to move their letter or have moved out of the county or out of the state or across to another church, they're requesting a letter from Union Hill Baptist Church so that they can join the membership there with a letter. And so that's the motion, and it probably comes with a second. Yes, comes from a second. Got a second. Uh, all in favor of that, say God bless them. <laughs> Any opposed? I didn't think so. Okay. Uh, this, thank you, Sue. Uh, who are the names? Somebody's asking who the names are that the letters they want to go. Uh, we granted letters to the Ewins and the Bartons. The Ewins, and Pam and Wayne. Wayne. Marie and Glenn Barton. Marie and Glenn Barton. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. All right. <clears throat> Back two weeks ago, we announced that we were going to have a special called meeting. And that called meeting would be for the purpose of electing the people who were going to be on the pastor search committee. In the past, I went back and asked Sue how we did it uh, the last two times that we have hired ministers. And basically, somebody got up and read the names, and then they voted on it, and that was it. This time, we asked everybody to make a nomination uh, that was wanting to make a nomination. We had 24 nominations. Out of the 24, we had 12 people who agreed to serve on the pastor search committee. And out of, those, out of those, we've voted on six. The personnel committee and the deacons all voted individually with no prompting or direction. Um, we had one member that was on the personnel committee that abstained from voting because she was one of the people who was nominated. I uh, also had one person that called me a little bit too late that said they were willing. I called that person back, asked them if it was okay for me to go ahead with the names that had already been submitted, and they said it would be. And so that's how we arrived at where we're at. Uh, but each person that was nominated was contacted. So the motion from the personnel committee to elect the following nominated persons to serve as a pastor search committee these individuals were nominated, agreed to serve, if asked, voted on by deacons and personnel, informed they were selected and are now presented to the church to elect. It is Seath Vick, Stephen Stewart, Kim Hellams, John Gentry, Leslie Marazzi, Nancy Barnett, and the alternate will be Joel Drake. Craig Sosby and Mike James will serve as advisors only, and that's called ad hoc. I asked Sue what ad hoc meant because I didn't know what ad hoc meant. Uh, <laughs> to this, thank you. I looked it up and it says a solution designed for a specific problem or task, and so we will not vote on the committee. Craig and I will not vote. We will only be there if the committee needs advice on something that they come have a question, then that will be it. Joel Drake is sitting over here. If somebody on the committee decides that they cannot serve any longer, Joel will then be added to the committee. And so that's the way it's going to work. 
So you have heard the names. I'm going to read them one more time. Seath Vick, Stephen Stewart, Kim Hellams, John Gentry, Leslie Marazzi, and Nancy Barnett. So if, if all those people are agreed by you, uh, I, I would put it this way. Those people um, are, are some of the best people that I know. And not that everybody in the, the nomination process was not the best people I know, but these people have been here a long time, and, and I think that those people will be some of the best people. Are there any questions that you have about the process or that? That comes from a motion from the personnel committee with a second from the deacons. Seeing no questions, all in favor, raise your right hand. Any opposed? The motion carries. Thank you. That'll take care of that business. I wanted to inform you while we're in a business meeting, uh, those people actually will meet next week. We will have a commissioning service here, uh, and Sid will be doing the commissioning service. Then after the service, we're going to have a training session down in the gym. Lunch will be provided for those people. The first order business, they will need to elect a chairman. I've already gotten in about seven resumes from different people who we've had put an ad in the Alabama Baptist. And so it, the process is moving forward. You need to continue to pray for these folks. I'm telling you, it is a major undertaking and something that none of them will take lightly. I promise you. I just wanted to give you a big praise while we are in the meeting. We were able to pay down $50,000 on our building fund debt. Uh, say amen, praise the Lord. Uh, it was a, quite a blessing. You know, y'all have just been so faithful in your giving. And I am always amazed at, at this church and its faithfulness to its giving. It is just a blessing to see. I talked to Dan, our treasury uh, secretary that takes care of all the finance and stuff. He said this is the most given church he has ever worked for. And so that is quite a blessing. Um, I just want to inform you, we do have two men who have agreed to serve as our new deacons. We've not yet had an ordination council, which we will do shortly so that I can announce the names of those men, but they, we, we have two men who have agreed to do that. I can announce one, which is Stephen Stewart. He has agreed to be one of our deacons, but he is already ordained, and so we won't have to have an ordination council for him. <laughs> so, but uh, the other person, we have to have an ordination council where the deacons come together and we ask just a few questions, make sure that the, all the requirements have met of that, that person, and then we will present him and we will set up a time for his ordination. So are there any questions about that? While we're in business, does anybody have any questions about anything? All right, do I have a motion we adjourn? Second? I want everybody to stand. This is going to be a little bit different. I want everybody to stand. You know, Brother Bill used to always say, God is good, and then you always say, all the time, all the time, God is good. So I want you to look at somebody and say, God is good all the time. And all the time, y'all are dismissed. Thank you. <laughs>